Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like a sound check. Can someone verify uh, that we can hear me? If someone could just uh, type in the yeah, chat. Exactly. Okay, thank you. No problem. Great. Thank you. Oh, good. Everybody's uh, awake. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Effie Battis, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we are the Audacia Foundation, a workforce investment organization. Uh, we're here today to provide home care providers with uh, information and updates related to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the third webinar we're offering uh, to home care providers. The information, uh, as we all know, continues to uh, evolve. And um, we're here today as, uh, as, a, as the Audacia Foundation and a workforce investment organization to continue to provide education to the long-term care sector on both city and state uh, level. So um, we have a, a lot of uh, new information. The information changes uh, periodically. Uh, we have information updates uh, released as uh, recently as uh, today that we're going to be sharing with all of you. And so just uh, to go over some details before we start, uh, all of us are becoming a lot more familiar with Zoom. Um, and so everyone is on mute. Uh, we do ask if you have questions uh, that you type them in the chat box. You can either type them to all participants or if you have questions you prefer to ask uh, just to the panelists, you can do that as well. We will leave some time at the end for questions and answers. And so with that, I would like to begin uh, so before we begin, I wanted to introduce uh, our presenter, Anne Frisch, uh, who this is the third webinar that Anne uh, is working with us uh, to educate, um, provide updates to providers. And she has extensive experience in over 30 years, post-acute and home care services. She has served as the executive director for New York City HHC home care division for many years. Uh, she's been through many provider challenges, transit strikes, hurricanes, Sandy 9-11, labor strikes, and the Ebola crisis. And she's held board positions for the Home Care Association of New York and New Jersey. And so with that, I would like to welcome Ann Prish. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So nice to join you again. Um, if I can just get a check that everyone can hear me. Yes, we can, Anne. Perfect. Thank you, Effie. And uh, great to be back again with everybody. Uh, this is certainly uh, a long haul and things evolve um, every day. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that uh, you feel as we feel that we are in a better place than we were several months ago, although still not where we need to be. So the... Um, Oops, where is my, okay. So the objectives for today's webinar are to just provide uh, you with any of the recent updates from CMS, DOH, OSHA, and the CDC. And I believe the last time we spoke um, was February, um, April 21st. So this spans from that period of time through today just to just set the parameters around this. Um, we thought it would be helpful to share some resources with you for the N95 fit testing. Uh, there have been some discontinuances of some of the waivers that were granted in the early stages of the pandemic, which I did want to make sure that everyone was aware of so that they can ensure that they stay compliant with all the regulatory requirements um, I'm hoping that uh, all of you are aware of the state-focused off-site surveys, which focus on infection control, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that in case you haven't been one of the lucky ones to be part of this yet. Um, 
big update uh, that just came through this morning. Uh, I was going to be talking about the stockpile from the New York State Department of Health and uh, mental hygiene. Uh, however, uh, there have been some uh, pretty groundbreaking updates that came through this morning, which I'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, what we uh, as the Audacia Foundation are really hoping is that following the presentation that you can share with us and with your colleagues some of the best practices and lessons learned in maintaining the essential home care services during the pandemic because we all know that we all play a part in in all of this but together um, I feel very strongly that we can get through anything and I know uh, just from speaking to some of you independently that um, you learned some lessons some of some of them were learned the hard way uh, but I'd love to be able to have you share those with your colleagues so uh, just to kind of set the stage uh, we all know that COVID-19 is still spreading in New York and that New Yorkers are required to continue wearing face coverings and maintaining social distancing um, this is also applicable to anyone that's using public or public or private transportation or riding in any for hire vehicles. And um, I, I bring this out uh, not because I, I don't think that you've heard it, but because as public health advocates, we want to make sure that we are all individually and collectively doing what we need to do to control the spread of this virus as much as we can. Now, for all essential businesses or entities, which we all pretty much fit into, any employees who are present in the workplace shall be provided and shall wear face coverings when in direct contact with customers or members of the public. And there should be modifications that have been made to uh, offices to uh, maintain distance, uh, ensure proper sanitation and cleaning of your environments. And, and that is the whole another subject um, that we won't really get into today, but I'm sure you've all been uh, provided with some of the information that you need in order to ensure that your environments are adjusted accordingly. New York City, as of the other day, is now in phase one of the state's regional reopening plan and the other areas, including just coming on board, Long Island and Mid Hudson Valley, are now in stage two. So we're really well into this. We're, we're sitting back, we're anxious. Uh, we hope that because of the loosening of many of these uh, requirements and opening of um, public venues that we're not gonna see a resurgence, but we still have to remain vigilant. And New York State continues to increase testing capacity for COVID-19 on a daily basis. Uh, healthcare workers, and first responders are prioritized for testing and can go to a test site run by New York State at no cost. So if you have employees that need to be tested, we've included the information below the New York State Department of Health COVID-19 hotline. And that number is there for you to receive information on sites in your area for the testing. Now, over the past few weeks, um, two significant repeals from existing waivers have come to our attention. The first is that New York has repealed the waiver that extended the time frame for submissions to the Home Care Worker Registry. This extension was discontinued on an executive order that was effective May 8th. And the other significant update related to repealing waivers is um, that, oh, an executive order uh, discontinued relief for record keeping requirements re related to maintaining medical records that are accurately reflecting the evaluation and treatment of patients. So early on, it was very clear that the state was uh, concerned because of uh, uh, 
you know, lots of people seeking healthcare services, that people got the services and had some leniency um, and relief on record keeping requirements, they're rolling that back somewhat. So I, I mention it because I uh, want to make sure that everyone knows so they don't find themselves in a position of um, regulatory non-compliance. And I'm sure you all know that the LICSA COVID-19 survey is no longer required. So uh, even though they do do other things in its place, I, you probably got a few more hours back in your day uh, as a result of them discontinuing the survey. Um, they also, uh, the state has also come out with guidance for home health aid and personal care aid training programs. And this guidance is intended for use by any um, organization that has an approved home health aid and personal care aid training program. And you know what the, the stipulations really are is that you have policies and procedures that incorporate the um, areas that are identified below. And so uh, one of the things that they've talked about is these training programs, if you're bring, bringing people back into classes that you uh, exercise the social distancing guidelines. So uh, you want to make sure that the size of the class, the number of trainees and instructors in the classrooms uh, and the skills labs allow you to be able to meet that requirements. Uh, you know, how the trainees and the students interact is something that you, you're going to need to consider as you move forward. The number of days of class and hours per training day, uh, having personal protective equipment for the trainees and trainers, as well as all the supplies for training purposes and making sure they are properly cleaned. Um, and any other local mandates that may be required relative to your geographic location. I know that we're probably speaking to people that span the state, so things may be a little bit different up in Buffalo than they are in New York City, so always make sure to check any local mandates related to gatherings. Um, you know, determine how to eliminate or reduce the potential risk of virus transmission in the classrooms. And I, I talked to that in terms of the uh, sanitizing of the, the skills lab and the things that people are touching. Uh, if your trainees are going to be allowed in and out of the agency throughout the training day, um, and if you're implementing infection control procedures, are you checking people's temperatures when they come in for the training and going through the COVID-19 screening um, form to make sure that they're not have, have an active case of COVID-19? Um, and making sure that they have access to hand, san hand sanitizer and the appropriate supplies for hand washing. Um, Again, I'm, I am not going to go through all of this, and I've included this just as it came through from the Department of Health for your review following the presentation. All of these presentations are put up on Audacious site, and I believe that our um, administrative staff also sends out presentations subsequent to the formal presentation so that you have all of this information available to you at your fingertips. Um, and again, here, here's you know, something that um, talks about the 16 hour supervised practical training requirement, which was noted in the 410 health advisory. Um, and that at this point that the practical training must still be conducted in a skills lab under the supervision of an approved nurse instructor. And on the health commerce site, there's additional information related to um, 
to this absolute training, as well as the um, email address for the home health aid training programs and the PCA training programs. And I could also tell you that over the past few months, I've had reason to reach out to um, these coordinators at the state related to questions that I've had about the training programs. And I was shocked at how responsive and helpful they were. So if you have questions, um, I think that um, you'll find that they're very receptive to helping and guiding you in the right direction. Um, a little bit about OSHA. Uh, don't know if you're aware, but under OSHA's record keeping requirements, COVID-19 is a recordable illness and therefore employers are responsible for recording cases of COVID if the case is a confirmed case of COVID-19 as defined by the CDC. The case is work-related uh, in the case of your employees and the case involves one or more of the general recording criteria set forth in the Federal Register. And I didn't include all of this information here because uh, this slide deck could have gone easily into 200 slides because there is just so much information. But if you do need more information and are unable to locate it, please let us know and we will be more than happy to um, put our finger on it and send it over to you. Uh, in exchange for the daily LIXA surveys, uh, they're now conducting um, focused off-site surveys related to COVID-19 infection control and policies and procedures. And um, in, in my uh, reading about this, it seems that um, they're not necessarily targeting every agency. They've started in the downstate region. They're working upstate but if you haven't been made aware of this or if you haven't been one of the lucky ones to uh, be part of the survey, uh, you will get a phone call from a rep from the DOH and um, they will be asking you to provide uh, requested materials within four hours. So uh, the reason that I, I share this is again to make sure that if there are any gaps in your organization um, to you know make sure that you plug them as soon as you can so that um, you are able to respond within the, the four hour time frame. Now, what they're looking for in the survey is really to assess the agency response to all the Department of Health guidance that's been offered for personnel and patients, as well as staff education in the use of PPE. And I'll just say, um, just keep in the back of your minds that towards the end of the presentation, I will take you to Audacia's website where there's a plethora of information and videos that really focus on infection control, donning and doffing, and things that may be helpful for you in meeting your staff education requirements in the use of PPE. Um, the infection control surveys, um, they're gonna ask for a copy of your current policy, uh, including COVID-19 guidance, and uh, I would presume that uh, these, you know, are pretty much updated at this point. We never had COVID before, but we probably all updated our policies effective in March to deal with things like a policy for the daily screening of staff, which I think we spoke about um, two webinars ago, the policy and protocol for staff returning to work followed COVID-19 exposure or infection, and the policy and protocol for screening patients for COVID-19 symptoms prior to accepting new admissions and referrals. And um, if you look back, if you still have access, although they are posted on the Audacia site, to our previous webinars, you will see that that information's there if you need to refresh your memory. 
but if you have any questions about that at this point, again, always feel free to contact us and we will do our best to get you the information. Um, the state is looking to see your records for infection control training that's been conducted in the past 45 days um, to include the, the names of the staff trained and what the content of the training was. So if you did uh, in services on donning and doffing, how to wear a mask, how to use your N95 respirator, whatever that might be. Make sure that your training materials reflect that because that is what they're looking for. Um, they also want to see a staffing plan for COVID-19 positive or suspected patients or the patients that are under investigation and things like, um, are you, do you have a team of aides that are solely caring for COVID-19 patients? Uh, are you, um, you know, sending a staff to a COVID-19 patient in the morning and then uh, a non-COVID-19 patient in the afternoon, possibly leading that other individual to exposure. So keep that in mind. And they also want a copy of the care plan for two COVID-19 positive patients you are currently caring for. So um, they really want to be sure that um, everything is in place. And if and when there's another round of this, that uh, we will have more in place than we may have had prior. Um, I, I alluded to uh, the, the N95 respirator, just as a review, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration requires an annual respirator fit test to confirm the fit of any respirator that forms a tight seal on the wearer's face before it's used. And you've probably heard uh, over the past few months that the fit, the fit testing requirement for annual fit testing had been waived. Um, but as cases diminish, this may be a good time to resume that so we can ensure that we are optimally protecting our patients and our staff. Um, I, I know that with this unexpected pandemic, um, many providers, you know, had minimal workers fit tested and able to ensure proper use of the N95. So again, now may be a good time. And we've again provided some easy resources. The first is um, a YouTube video that we shared after the last webinar that we did which shows you how you can easily do fit testing in your agency. And then um, I know that many of you use mobile health for your occupational health services. They recently announced that they have a fit kit, okay, which is an all-in-one fit testing solution for small businesses. And this will allow you to easily fit test workers at your place of business. And if you need more information, there's an email address here at Mobile Health to get you additional information. It's not difficult to fit test. You just need to, someone just needs to know how to do it. Um, another DOH initiative is that, and many of you have probably already received these calls. Um, they are validating uh, the home care PPE and staffing, reaching out to you by phone, um, asking about your staffing. They are interested in the number of eight hours that were provided in January compared with the most recent numbers. Um, they are also calling the LICSAs to verify reported data for a specific day of the month. So they're looking to do a deeper dive into the validation of that data. Um, they will not allow data to be changed retrospectively. So we want to make sure that we give them the most up-to-date data that we have so that they can gauge what other efforts or interventions are needed on their behalf to support the operations of um, our 
home health care system in New York. And uh, they're also, I understand, been verifying status of PPE in agencies to ensure that they have PPE on hand for um, th this pandemic. Now, <laughs> there's, you know, for a few weeks, things were really slow. Um, there wasn't much change. And then we began seeing that they began pulling back some of the waivers in May. And just this morning, early this morning, I got a phone call. I don't know how many of you have heard this yet. And I wish that I could see the expression on everybody's face because it was probably similar to the expression I had when I got the phone call about this. But um, effective uh, today, DOH is beginning to wind down distribution of PPE as they believe that the supply chain is returning, uh, you know, to somewhat normal levels and the pandemic moves into, into a suppression phase. Um, the DOH MH PPE stockpile was intended for emergencies so they say and as we move away from operating in a time of crisis also moving away from being a source of PPE so in plain simple terms what that sounds like is that um, within the next week or so you won't be receiving any more PPE from DOH MH stockpile. Um, not sure why, uh, this is just my own commentary, not sure why they don't think that we're not in an emergency situation. We still currently have a pandemic declared um, and we are yet to see the effects of uh, you know, returning to some level of normalcy as well as some of the other activities that um, have been going on throughout um, our state. So uh, time will tell. And uh, in preparation for not being able to get supplies from DOH MH, I've um, did a copy and paste from that information to provide you with the list that came out with that alert of other vendors that um, the city of New York is stating could perhaps um, assist you in your PPE needs. So um, this list um, could change and recommendations could evolve as our situation evolves. But um, again, here is a nice resource document for you. Um, and uh, hopefully if you needed things and you called one or some of them, you could conceivably get the supplies you needed. Also, um, this, and this is just released early this morning, that um, there are free face coverings available. The city of New York um, will distribute 2 million face coverings citywide to small businesses and their employees as they move to toward reopening the local economy. Um, there are links to all of this, anything that's in blue or below in purple. If you uh, open up in presentation mode on your computer, it will take you to all the information that you need to access their, this, this um, uh, access these materials. Now, um, one of the things that they said is they will only give five face coverings per employee and they are recommending that we encourage um, our patients to wear these while we're with them. So I'm not sure how five face coverings per employee is going to be maximally effective, but um, again, it is certainly a start. And I encourage you um, subsequent to this call to go and click on any of these areas and you will get additional information that should assist you in procuring this information. Another supply list which um, 
the Office of Emergency Management in Nassau County had published several weeks ago. I don't know if you saw it. There's a lot of vendors on here. This list is broken up by the particular supply. So you'll see um, on this first page here, these vendors have isolation gowns, and then there are vendors with uh, N95 masks, KN95 masks, um, surgical gowns. Uh, now, as you all know, the inventory changes minute by minute. You can get an email from someone saying that I have this, and by the time you go to get it, it's gone. So um, between the list that we had provided and vetted for you, early uh, in April, the end of March, and these two other lists, we're hoping that you find them to be good resources for you if you have any gaps in your PPE needs, particularly now that DOHMH uh, is doing away with um, distribution of the stockpile. Something else that uh, came about, we knew that New York City had some childcare services free of charge for essential healthcare workers. Uh, now we found out that, um, again, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but certainly a good resource for many of the people who you employ. The Early Care and Learning Council has, um, been able to offer childcare scholarships for essential workers at no cost. The uh, household salary eligibility is listed below. Um, it's part of the CARES Act and all the necessary links are there. So if you have employees that you feel would benefit by this, or even if you want to just distribute this information in terms of trying to help them uh, reduce out-of-pocket costs, find a place for their child to go, this might be um, a good option. So all the information is here and hoping that we can get some of our essential healthcare workers part of these scholarships. I um, wanted to also share with you some of the other things that Audacia is presently working on. Um, we, uh, both myself and Effie and Barbara and really all the folks at Audacia have been particularly concerned about the mental health aspects of all of this on healthcare providers. but particularly home care providers from our vantage point because of the unique challenges um, that home care providers have. Um, so uh, we've been spending the past few weeks trying to determine the, the right um, uh, program or uh, intervention, if you will, to help um, healthcare workers, home care workers um, with mental health needs um, during and after the pandemic. So next week on April 16th, HCA in collaboration with Audacia is sponsoring a virtual roundtable discussion with their board members on recognition, resilience, and retention of home care workers for the purpose of really conducting an in-depth needs assessment from the, the providers, the administrators, many of you who are on the phone, as to what our home care providers need from a mental health perspective to get us through and, and, and the implications that will follow for probably many years after. We have the American uh, Psychological Association working with us on this. They're going to be actually leading the round table. We have um, an associate professor from the City University of New York, which has also done some in-depth work about grief 
in-home health aides, which actually dovetails um, very well with um, you know, the work that we're doing now and actually got a, a message. I'm sorry if I said that this round table was April 16th. What I meant to say is that it is June 16th. It is next week. It's for the board of HCA, which does rep represent some of our membership and some of the membership on the phone. And then from that point on, given the information that we find out, we will be back in touch to to talk about next steps and how, again, Audacia and other organizations in the city can be a resource for um, our home health aides and for our LICSAs. Uh, presently, Audacia is uh, also working on a PCA refresher course. It's not something that is seeking approval from the Department of Health or the State Education Department, but it is merely something that um, is presently being designed to um, show that we recognize the needs of PCAs and that there often isn't much information or knowledge um, out there regarding what gaps they may have or if they're coming from a private duty setting and not technically a PCA, they might want to attend the refresher course in preparation for going to a licensed agency to be um, accepted as a PCA. So really um, just to acknowledge that uh, we recognize that there's a continuing need for education and support. And um, Effie, I don't know if you at this point want to talk a little bit about um, additional online resources that Audacia has. Um, you know, we um, just yes. to, um, we, if you, if you, and the link is here actually, but if you go to audaciafoundation.org, up on the top, there's a little tab that um, will bring you to Audacia Resources, all of our webinars, as well as a whole host of COVID-19 resources that Audacia has developed. And some, if you haven't seen them, go look at them. They are absolutely the best in class that I've seen through uh, a myriad of different organizations, but they can help in service your staff on various topics. But in addition to that, um, there are other online resources that Effie, if you wanna talk about for a minute to just let the group know that we are working to get them online. Absolutely, thank you, Anne. Just wanted to bring uh, to uh, the provider's attention the uh, uh, some of the other things that, that we've been working on offering online related to VBP uh, measures. So uh, we've heard from providers that there are um, uh, uh, that we are in the process of um, developing, obviously we understand providers are working on the PPE uh, that are, I'm so sorry, providers are working on uh, getting their staff in service uh, as they have to meet those requirements. Uh, our online resources are uh, focused on VBP measures. Our funding from the Department of Health and our program development focuses on VBP measures. So we recognize that providers are in the process of you know, having to catch up with in-service uh, requirements. And so we know that those come first. Our programming focuses on VBP measures. Uh, those are uh, obviously secondary to the in-service requirements. And as per our funding, we are designated to be separate from that funding. Um, but those are courses that we're developing um, as well as have online and, and they're available online in multiple languages. And so we encourage uh, everyone to uh, find out more about how to access that as we move towards more remote learning uh, over the next few months. Um, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, 
it's the reality of where most of the education has to occur for now um, until we can, working with uh, agencies that we've partnered with, we can determine um, based on the space requirements um, how to proceed with live education, um, recognizing uh, some of the, the new limitations that have been placed on that. Um, I just also wanted to comment um, that, uh, you know, regarding the Department of Health um, and the assistance with PPE, uh, the Department of Health is not completely stopping uh, the assistance uh, with the PPE. And uh, the Department of Health recognizes that each agency is in a unique situation and is definitely committed to assisting in any way possible. Um, so, uh, you know, each, uh, so, so you're encouraged um, as providers to secure your own PPE when available. Uh, but the Department of Health will, is, uh, will continue to be there to support providers um, as needed. So just wanted to reiterate that uh, as, you know, uh, the PPE that was available uh, during the pandemic directly from the Department of Health uh, was uh, really intended uh, to be support because PPE was not avail readily available from independent uh, distributors. And so, um, and so the, you know, the, the change, the recent changes as of today are based on information that distribution is, is readily available to providers. So, um, you know, we encourage you to take advantage of that and again, the Department of Health is, is available to be a resource when needed. So uh, just to continue, you know, to keep us and, and the Department of Health uh, apprised of any issues you have, uh, any ongoing issues you're having with uh, PPE, should they arise. And as the purpose of these forums as well, webinars, uh, reaching out to us, uh, we can also be a conduit to the Department of Health uh, should there be issues uh, you identify in securing PPE or anything else. Um, I know, Anne, you wanted to take some time to uh, ask providers some questions um, as well as uh, ask about any best practices. I'm not sure how you uh, would like to do that? Do you want to, uh, we can open it up for a chat if anyone has questions they would like to pose um, or else uh, I know we can open the um, ability for uh, people to comment and speak, uh, but our preference is because there is a lot of times background noise is uh, for someone to use the chat or raise your hand and then we can uh, unmute that, uh, that participant. And what are your Yeah, that, that would be great. I, you know, um, and, and Effie, thank you for clarifying that piece on the uh, PPE. Um, I, I actually neglected to focus on that because I was so intent upon just sharing the information, but that was also mentioned in um, some of the correspondence that I, I saw this morning. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, just to echo what Effie said, um, I like to think of us as advocates for you. Um, you know, there are a lot of individuals that work for Audacia, the Southern New York Association. Um, they were on calls all day, every day. We have the ability to really um, speak to what are some of the concerns and the challenges that you're experiencing in the front line. But in order to be able to do that, we need to hear from you. So um, I, I would like to open it up. Um, Lilia, I, I don't know the best way to do this, but if we could open it up and, you know, uh, whether it's a best practice that you've learned, a lesson learned, uh, a concern that you have, a question. I see that there look like there's some 
considerable amounts of questions in the chat box. Those I can easily respond to, uh, you know, following this in a Q and A, like I've sent out in the past. Um, but I, I would love to be able to have a better understanding of where we all are today and how we could continue to help and advocate for you. Who's going to go first? I see one hand, Elizabeth Muniz. Okay. Elizabeth? Hello? Maybe she's on, is she still on mute? She's unmuted. Elizabeth? Oh, no, she said that was a mistake. Oh, okay. No <laughs> she problem. Doesn't want, that's fine, Elizabeth. Thank you. You don't want to be picked on. We understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank there's, you. There's no stupid question, and there's, you know, all comments are welcome and um, really encouraged. So, uh, please. And do you have uh, any um, best practices that you've been hearing from uh, providers um, yeah. that you wanted to share? Yes, I actually do. And they're kind of around the PPE piece. And I, I've read that there were providers in New York doing this. I also have, I read a lot of the national publications. So I see that there's national agencies that are doing this. And, and I'm sure many of you have thought of this and are doing this, but to ease the burden on getting PPE to your staff, um, agencies have been designing uh, PPE kits for COVID patient care versus non-COVID patient care. And they are sending these out to aides in bulk so that they have them. And when they go into a patient's home, if it's a COVID patient that they're caring for, they grab, you know, they, they have in their bag, they have a COVID, um, you know, bag with, you know, the N95 or the KN95 or, you know, a gown, etc. So that we don't have AIDS you know, constantly coming into the offices that are, you know, going into supply closets and taking this and taking that because it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of touch that's happening there. So some agencies were sending them out to their aides. Some agencies were setting up some central locations um, for aides to pick this up. Um, I always say that, you know, the best way to know what is going to work is to ask your workforce, what would make it easiest for you? Uh, we know people, you know, don't like to travel on public transportation any more than they have to, um, not to mention the fact that travel is time taken away from patient care. So um, I would be interested, um, now that we brought this up, to hear from some of you on the line as to if anyone has uh, experienced a best practice in getting PPE to your team? <laughs> Do you hear me? I can hear you. Hi. Well, one of the things that we did at our agency was that we had um, everything kind of prepackaged in bags already. And um, so whenever the aides did come by to pick them up, everything was already there. It was just a matter of handing it over to them. And that was it. And then the, the aides that were actually uh, living in patients' homes, we would deliver that. I mean, we would um, mail it out to them. Mm -hmm. So I think prepackaging everything versus having to, you know, go through everything when, you know, every aid came in was kind of a, a good practice because you weren't exposing anything, you weren't touching everything all the time. Um, so the exposure to, to touching things was minimized by having everything prepackaged. Right, absolutely. And, you know, clearly that seems to have been a practice that um, has disseminated the country in various areas. And, lessons learned and you know we we've done we've we've learned i think um 
you know, with everything bad that's occurred, I think we've learned some really good things that might help facilitate the work we do on a daily basis, even when we're not dealing in a pandemic. And um, I'd love to hear from, um, you know, we have over a hundred and some odd people on the phone. Surely there's something that some of you are doing that's making a huge difference, whether it's making your aides feel more valuable, your coordinators more valuable, um, addressing concerns with patients. Let's just open it up and share it because there's no better way to- well, I, I, think, I think one of the things that um, I've realized with my aides is, you know, how everybody goes around saying, oh, nurses are the heroes, you know, the doctors are the heroes, et cetera. And uh, when I speak to my aides, of course, you know, a lot of them would call in, you know, they were scared, um, they didn't know what to do. Um, of course, we were there, we were always there for them as a support system. And one of the things that I kept on saying to them and reinforcing even so yesterday was that they were my heroes, you know, that they, you know, at the hospital settings, the nurses were, you know, and the doctors were and therapists were heroes, but to us in the home care, um, um, in the home care setting, they were our heroes and they were the ones that were out there risking their lives. So giving them the merit and, and, and allowing them to know that we did acknowledge that they were going to work every single day, risking themselves and their family members, um, I think was definitely um, a positive because they felt so good. About, you know, they, 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 they felt appreciated, they felt acknowledged, they felt like they were worth something. Absolutely. And that is so, so important, the recognition, um, because it's certainly, you know, the, the wages, you know, and, ha and even if you paid them more money, um, mm -hmm. but that recognition, and I've heard it repeatedly, that um, they are so appreciated because they really are the unsung heroes yes. um, through all of this. And, um, and, and that's one of the reasons, I mean, there are many reasons why we are looking into this mental health piece for the AIDS because we recognize that they're so alone with this also. Mm -hmm. And we want to be, they're scared for themselves, they're scared for the patient, they're scared for their family. Um, and, I, and they often don't have the resources to be able to navigate the healthcare system or reach out to get the mental health support that they need. So, um, you know, we're really excited to see what comes of the round table and to be able to perhaps move forward and, and do something much more impactful. I see that um, Fran wrote that um, she wrote handwritten notes to my home health aides with a gift card mm -hmm. who were working with or exposed to COVID. I'm curious, Fran, what was the reaction of the aides to that? Uh, Fran is probably still on mute. There, thank you for, uh, for those of you that did uh, share some of your uh, uh, practices regarding uh, PPE. They definitely um, are definitely uh, very useful. Um, we do have one question also uh, from uh, a participant about how providers are dealing with 24-hour living cases who have been hospitalized, uh, COVID positive, and are now ready to return home. They're negative, but uh, no one is available to disinfect the home before services resume. Any thoughts on how that should be addressed? Surely some of you have, you know, 24 hour aids in the home and, and I can see just from the question, it's a huge challenge. Um, it is an absolute huge challenge, but um, are the aids the ones that are going in and disinfecting the home? And we also have one question from Marjorie Bass. Bass. Uh, she wants to uh, ask a question. I'll allow her to talk. Sure. And we'll go back to the other question about the disinfecting the hall, man. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't have a, um, a 
an answer for this. I mean, clearly, you know, um, this has to be something that is occurring um, or maybe the homes aren't disinfected or maybe the aides are going there uh, before, you know, I mean, I know that oftentimes aides do hospital pickups, but they don't necessarily get into the home before the patient does. So I'm, I would be curious to understand better how you do that. It says somebody responded, they have the client's family disinfect the home. Mm -hmm. And depending on if what other services, if the client has OP, WDD, uh, speaking with the care manager. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yes, it's obviously not a, uh, someone said our aides are not disinfecting the home. Um, right, uh, there's, um, I guess there's differences in opinion. Um, it's not necessarily uh, within the scope of what the aid is uh, required to do. So but it does present a challenge. Right, uh, absolutely. Yes, so uh, let's, let's look at the other question and maybe we can uh, get back to everyone on that if we can't uh, address it directly. Um, it says people are saying uh, cleaning service, uh, family should hire service, HHA can do light housekeeping. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, now, there was another question here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'd like the, um, someone had said, although I kind of, I think I lost the, uh, uh, there was someone. Yeah, the question is no longer there. <laughs> uh, let's see. No, it's not here anymore. It's not here. Yeah. And there was someone that did say related to, um, they use mass text messaging to the aides as to where they could be you know, the packets can be picked up or make an appointment with the office so they don't have too many people mm -hmm. in the office at the same time. So, uh, right. yeah, that was good. Those are all great ideas. And thank you for those of you that uh, did um, offer uh, your insight into the, uh, the question about the cleaning service or the families. Um, and I know that Howard just said by giving different PPE kits based upon COVID versus non-COVID, you would be in violation of HIPAA. Um, however, um, when the aides go into the home, they know if the patient is COVID positive or not. Is that not correct? I, I'm, I'm asking our, our, our group of uh, agencies here. Aren't the aides aware of who is positive versus not? Okay. Um, you know, I'm not, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that it, it has someone's name on it, but if the aide is going to a patient's home, they know based on the aide's care plan what kind of precautions they need to take. So, um, you know. It's saying, yes, people are saying um, the aides are aware, right? right. They, exactly. they, yeah, right. it was the comment that was made I that mean, I to clarify, we know the patients that are positive versus not. Now, in the HIV world, that's a little bit different issue. Um, and those individuals are protected by some different laws and every, you know, for the, um, uh, precautions that need to be taken; those are general precautions. But in the in the COVID world, um, the the aides know which of the patients are COVID or not. Uh -huh. uh, right. They said DOH said it's not a HIPAA violation because it's a public health issue. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so the one question we had uh, is no longer. Um, being listed as a question. Thank you to the panelists for helping us uh, answer some of the other questions. That's uh, what we what we intended for uh, this as as a best practice, or to help some other providers um, 
get clarification on questions they had. Um, as we're coming uh, to the conclusion uh, of our webinar, um, I want to say thank you uh, to Anne for uh, being with us today. And uh, thank you to all the panelists uh, for your participation. And um, we will be releasing the uh, slide deck as well as a recording of this webinar. And there'll be a link to our site to view our other webinars as well. So, Effie? Um, yes. Sorry, it's Barbara. I just wanted to add, and this might be the right place for that, that there is a uh, email address to contact us um, if you're interested in the online training that was talked about. Okay. And that, I, I will read it uh, slowly for anybody that would like it. It's training-online at audaciafoundation.org. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. So thank you, everyone. And there's also uh, an email uh, account, COVID response at audaciafoundation.org. So feel free to uh, privately send us any of your questions, and we will, uh, we will do our best to address them uh, promptly. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again to all of you who uh, really are uh, doing everything you can um, and, and we appreciate uh, your commitment and, and at the Audacia Foundation we, uh, we support you uh, and thank you. And with that everyone stay safe and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.